I'm Sarah Hughes. Um, I'm from CareCloud. I've been a product manager there for almost three years now. Um, so I was asked to come speak to you guys, and the topic I want to talk about is overcoming the obsession with the MVP. So I actually think this is a pretty important topic from a product perspective. Um, you know, we're always kind of under the gun to deliver this MVP product, and I want to talk about one of the examples at CareCloud, one of the products that we've worked on where I think that we did a pretty decent job um, kind of avoiding that obsession with the MVP. So um, I'll start off by talking about what CareCloud is. I'm not sure if, how familiar you guys are. Um, we are a PM and EHR software. So what that means is uh, we're a software for medical practices, uh, practice management, and electronic health records. So the practices use our software to schedule appointments for patients with their doctors. They use our software to bill insurance companies um, for the procedures that their providers you know, perform. Um, and basically, it's a series of apps that we deploy that we help them do all of those things. So just, I won't go through every app, of course, but I'll show you just a couple of the ones I'm talking about, and then I'll get to um, the CareCloud product. So a couple of the examples, we have an appointments app. So like I said, the front desk person at a medical practice would use this app to schedule the appointment between a patient and a doctor. Um, like I said, we have a billing app that helps figure out which insurance companies to bill based on procedures that were done. Um, we have an analytics app that helps practices kind of run productivity reports to see how their providers are doing, how much they're making, how many uh, patients they're seeing, that kind of thing. So within that analytics app in specific, um, we have something called the command center, right? So we released this product back in 2014. And the command center is basically a scorecard for the practice that kind of shows them all their key performance indicators, all their KPIs, how they're doing um, in certain metrics. So how much they're making every month, how many patients they're seeing, what's their AR like. All, all of these kind of important metrics right when they log into the system, you know, right at their fingertips. As opposed to having to go in and run reports and, you know, ask the front office person and the back office person to do these things for them. It's kind of available right when you log in, whether you're a physician or um, you know you work in the back office or, or the front office. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, it's a practice performance scorecard. So we have the list of KPIs right at the user's fingertips. They're able to drill in and see different you know, trending models. If their payments are you know, trending upwards, if they're trending downwards, they can drill in to um, see you know, provider level information, location level, so they might want to see how their different providers are being paid you know, across the board or across different locations. So they have that, all, all that information available to them as well. So the way that we went about this process um, back in 2014, so step one is obviously, you know, everyone's familiar with this from a product development lifecycle standpoint, but we you know, are designing based on the requirements. So what we did was we had several of our clients tell us, you know, we love the analytics app and we really appreciate that you have hundreds of these reports ready for us to run, but it's kind of cumbersome, and we're not exactly sure the information that we need or, or how to get it. So maybe you guys can kind of put it in our face and show us right when we log into the system what's important to me and, and what do I care about. So that was really, really the main need. Um, so the design specs that were put together back in 2014 actually have more features in those specs than what we've released to date. <laughs> so we have been you know, iterating and iterating since 2014. We've been you know, going at this for, for quite some time. Um, so step two was obviously based on those design specs, we had to kind of draw a line in the sand and pick what are we gonna deliver for MVP. So obviously there was a lot of scope that was cut. Um, we made a decision, like we think that this is gonna be the minimum viable product for our customer base. And we just said this is what's gonna go out for the first version. Now back in 2014, it was really easy to just say, hey, this is going to be the MVP, let's see what happens, and then a couple months after we'll release something you know, bigger and better. But what's really been happening lately is the MVPs turned into sort of a, a trial and error, right? It's sort of a proof of concept. So we release MVPs, we kind of see, is this going to fail or is this going to succeed? Clients nowadays are expecting a lot more from that first product that you actually put out there. And I think that's actually a good thing because it kind of shows you that they are, are, are they going to use this product or are they going to completely ignore it? And you can pivot very quickly. Um, 
So part of the reason, obviously, to deliver an MVP at a specific point and to cut scope from that original design is the need to deliver quickly. So we had actually at the time, back in 2014, we had a couple of really large clients who said, I'm not renewing my contract until I have the scorecard that was promised to me. Right? So when you have kind of customer deadlines imposed on you, as opposed to just this is a cool feature that we're building, you know, let's see where it goes, um, you kind of are forced to deliver you know, at a certain point. So we can talk about the pro product roadmap all we want, but at a certain point, you kind of have to pick a date and say, we're going to release you know, this the way it is. Um, so after we released the MVP back in 2014, so you know, the, the first one, we did a case study on some clients, and this was one of the quotes from one of our users. So the command center gives me a detailed snapshot of numerous KPIs instantly. The visual display makes it easy for me to see the improvements in financials, and I no longer have to go into Excel to build graphs myself. I can go in and get the answers I need immediately. It's just so easy. So basically, we nailed the MVP, right? So <laughs> no, but you, know, you, you get quotes like this, and then you feel kind of good, and you're like, OK, well, we, we did, we, you know, we did pretty well. Why, why, why bother putting more resource into resources into this, and why bother kind of continuing? But what I wanted to point out here is that you have, you know, a pretty great quote from one of our clients, but there was a ton of other external users and internal users as well that were telling us, listen, in order for this to be useful to physicians, in order for this to be useful for other clients in the practice, you need to add more, and this is what we need. So a lot of companies today, they kind of drop that whole MVP moniker because nobody cares about a minimum viable product anymore. So a lot of companies are using something called MAP, which is a minimum awesome product. And we're trying to use that at our company as well. Um, what they really care about is what's useful to them. Not the first thing that you're going to release so that I know that this is just a version that's going to get better, but what, what is really going to bring me value as a user? And I think that. I think that the, the trend is actually a good trend because it shows that you deliver an MVP as a proof of concept and then you're able to make a decision quickly as to whether or not you're going to continue on that route or you're going to kind of scrap it, right? Um, so finally, step three of the whole process is to iterate. Um, the one thing that we're trying to avoid in this situation is delivering that MVP and then kind of forgetting about it. Right? So the importance of going back to the customers who are using it and saying, you know, what don't you like? Watch how they use it. What do you like about it and how, how we can improve this? In addition to the roadmap that we already have for it. So like I said, the original 2014 specs actually had more features than what we currently have in production today. So we might have a plan for the product, but in the meantime, there's also a lot of internal and external feedback telling us how we should improve that product. So our process for the specific product in, in particular is the typical you know, product development lifecycle roadmap. So when you, you know, as a product person, when you show a, road, a roadmap to internal stakeholders or the executive team or whoever it may be, you have this pretty you know, long straight line, that's like an arrow, and you say Q1, we're gonna deliver all these amazing things, and Q2, we're gonna deliver more amazing things. But really, <laughs> what the real process is, is just very, very circular. And it's really important to put time in our roadmaps on the products that we currently are working on to make sure that we can always be improving them. So the basic process is you listen to the customer's needs and you design based on the requirements and then you deliver the MVP. And then you go back and you do it again. You go and talk to those customers and you see how they're using it. You build newer requirements, you design to those requirements and then you deliver version one. And then so on and so forth. <laughs> um, so obviously one of our biggest jobs as product managers is to kind of take in all of that feedback and make decisions on whether it's warranted that we actually implement it, right? So one of the mistakes that I see a lot is, you know, we hear some feedback about our product and we want to go and implement it right away because we want to make that customer happy, right? But the really important question to ask is what, what issue are they trying to solve? What problems are they having and how can we actually solve those problems with the product that you're deploying? Right, so it's really important to kind of empathize with the client, to see how they're using your product, and to see where the pain points are. Because a lot of times it's a lot easier to just send over a survey, and ask, you know, do you like it? How much do you like it? What would you change? What feature would you like? Right, that's kind of the easy way. What, what I've seen is, for example, if it's a net new product, hasn't been built yet, 
I've had a lot of success going to clients and asking them, what do you think of these mock-ups? Have them actually see the design and say, we're thinking about developing this from scratch. We think it has a lot of value. Do you, do you feel the same way and where would you change things? And that feedback is very valuable because it's before development's even started. And you can actually kind of put that on the roadmap and say, listen, a lot of clients feel this way about this. So we're not changing it, but we're, we're adding a different you know, look to it. Whereas products that are already established, I find it very valuable to actually watch the user using it. So you see where they're clicking, you see where they're having a hard time, you see what they find enjoyable in the product. Um, so to that point, a product is never really finished, right? We've been working on the Command Center since 2014 when we first deployed it, and it's now 2017, and we release either a new feature or enhancement probably every quarter. Um, the idea is that our customers can depend on the fact that this is an ever-improving product and that it's not just going to sit there um, you know, and, and, ha and grow dust, pretty much. And if you think about the most successful products out there today, your iPhone, Amazon Echo, you know, whatever it may be, salesforce.com, you expect with every new release, every new enhancement, you expect for it to just be a better product. It's just something that's expected as a customer. So the um, continued iteration that I was talking about is, is very much so based on, at least for this product, our customer's feedback. So we have internal customers as well as external. Internal, we have client success managers who actually kind of deal with our clients hands-on. So they provide reports from the command center to their clients and they tell them, this is how you're doing you know, for certain KPIs. So we get a lot of feedback internally that, and, they, and they, they kind of tell us, listen, clients really want to see this, our clients are having a really hard time with this. So we're kind of lucky in that aspect. But you know, for the MVP, we delivered a basic set of KPIs, what we thought would be useful. And like I showed you in the screenshots, there was you know, some trending available and you can drill in to provider and location levels. For V1, what we heard from clients was, listen, these KPIs are great, but we would like to also see this, this, and this. And when a lot of people are asking for the same KPIs, it's probably relatively valuable to them. So we added more KPIs to the command center and we also added variances across timeframes. What that means is, you know, it's interesting to them to see my total payments for January 2017 were X amount, but I would like to know relative to January 2016 what that number was, or relative to January 2015. So we gave them options of variances you know, across, across their KPIs, and also a social feature that we released was real-time comments. So everyone at the practice who has access to the command center, they can kind of comment on each KPI to each other and say, hey, listen, our patient visits are trending downwards. You know, let's get together and see how we can attack this problem, for example. So our V2, which we released earlier this year, was we added a couple of new features. We added the ability to actually share this scorecard. So a lot of people were saying that it was really great to kind of print out the trend views and the graphs and all that, but they just kind of wanted to share it and send it across their practices. And then we also added configurable KPIs. So we thought we were doing something awesome in V1 by delivering so many more KPIs, but then customers came back and said, listen, these are great, but I'm not necessarily interested in all of them. So we made the command center a little bit more configurable so they can show and hide you know, what they're interested in. And then for this year, the plan is to show our customers what actions actually drive those KPIs. So yeah, we might tell them you're making you know, this amount of money every month, you're bringing in this amount of money, but what actually drives that KPI? Is it um, how much you're being reimbursed by insurance companies? Or is it how many patients you're seeing each day? And how can you actually change those trends the way that you want to? And then we also want to add deep linking to the reports. So what that means is you know, they can drill into one of these KPIs, but maybe they want to see actually the line by line detail of what made that, made that KPI up. So we would link them straight to those analytics reports that they keep saying are very cumbersome and hard to run on their own. So we're tricking them in a way. Um, so finally, I just wanted to share this quote because I was reading this article the other day on TechCrunch and it was about, the title was something like um, Mark Zuckerberg's crazy 2017 revolution, uh, New Year's resolution. And what he said was he wants to go to every single state in the United States to talk to Facebook users. And that's not, that's not crazy at all. You know, I, I just think that this quote really put it in perspective. And, the more you know about customers, the more effective your strategy is likely to be. Your products and services will be better 
No company has ever lost money by knowing too much about their customer. So I think that's really just the main way to kind of overcome that MVP obsession is to make sure that you have a pulse on your customer. I think from a product perspective, that's really, really the most valuable thing that we can do is to make sure we understand and we empathize with what their needs are, what they're looking for, and how we can actually make their lives easier. I think that's it. <laughs> I have threes. <laughs> you're um, so as you were saying, you know, you're, you're constantly iterating and making changes and listening to your customers and figuring out you know, what changes need to be made. Um, you have a lot of customers. So how do you qualify and prioritize the, the needs of your users? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually a really good question. Um, I think what's really important to understand here is for example, in our situation, Care Club, we have several different apps and so many different products. So what we like to do is kind of find these focus groups for certain products because we can't possibly ask, you know, three, four, five thousand customers, hey, how do you feel about this one thing? And then try to implement that feedback. So what we like to do is kind of focus on maybe a group of super users or for when we're developing new products, um, we have a set of customers who we know love to beta new things. They like to be on the cutting edge. So those are the ones that I kind of, I, I go to our potential beta clients and I say, listen, we're building something really new, you know, would you be interested in this? So you kind of have to narrow it down a little bit. Uh, okay, so how is, how is your product team structured? Like, um, like the size of the team, engineers, product managers? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the director of product at Care Cloud is actually right over here. <laughs> So our team is actually pretty small. We have uh, six people on it, and then we have about 55 engineers. Um, and are there any good product management resources that, that you go to books, podcasts, that you can recommend to the audience? Yeah, um, if anybody follows the pragmatic marketing uh, listing, they have fantastic articles. And then there's also a blog called Mind the Product. Um, Mind the Product is a product management conference that originated over in London and they came over to San Francisco last year for the first time. So now they're doing it every year and it's a really cool conference. But they have a fantastic blog. It brings like the best PM writers from across the industry. Uh, then I have one more question and then I want to take it to the audience. So um, what is your development and sprint methodology? Um, are you waterfall? Are you agile? Is there a sprint cycle in two or four weeks? Sure. Um, so we are an agile company, and I think that, especially the example that I gave you, that's kind of, it's most conducive, you know, to being agile. We have had, you know, times where we were waterfall. It depends on the project, really. Some projects require you to be waterfall. Um, but I do believe that the agile methodology is kind of the most, most forgiving and, and the easiest to develop in. Uh, what was your second question? Oh, the sprints, yes. Um, we, have, we go back and forth. We've had two-week sprints and we've had four-week sprints, but normally we like to release monthly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So for the audience, who has a question? Yeah. Go for it. Um, what do you do if you have a bunch of customers throwing a bunch of different things at you for a bunch of different features? How do you prioritize um, what is going to be most important and what are most people going to use? Because you know that not every single user is going to just start throwing stuff at you. So how do you basically read into the people who aren't giving you feedback? That is an excellent question and that's 99% of my job. So, <laughs> um, there's this matrix that a lot of product managers use and they kind of put all the feature requests in buckets, right? So they look and see which feature, some people call it low hanging fruit, which is a really easy quick fix that we can get out there to make some of the customers happy, right? Sometimes you can prioritize those more heavily because they're easy. Uh, which enhancements or changes are gonna require a lot of development effort, right? Those are gonna have to be kind of road mapped. Um, which are gonna save us money, or which are gonna cost us money. So those are kind of the four things that you look at. You look at resource availability, um, how many engineers do you have on deck that can actually start working on something like this? And then you look at 
the development effort, whether it's going to take a long time or a short time. And then you do a cost-benefit analysis, and you see really what's more cost-inducive in the scenario. <laughs> uh, to piggyback off his question, uh, how do you handle really uh, annoying, I guess, calling myself, salespeople that are pushing you to develop products that you're uh, one of those. Maybe you wouldn't want to. Yeah, I'm one of those. <laughs> um, but you know, often pushing the company forward, uh, just from MD Live, so oh. your, your world as well. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Cool. Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. I think that's like the most dreaded thing from a product <laughs> management perspective, like across you know the entire industry. So I think there's two ways to handle that. So from a sales perspective, it's kind of a mentality, right? The sales leaders, it's, it's on their shoulders to kind of let the team know, listen, this can be sold you know, at this time, otherwise we don't have a product before then. Or it depends on the deal. If you have a really large, <laughs> right, that's always what it comes back to, it depends on the deal. So the problem with that is y you get into this e exact scenario. You have to deliver something earlier than you want to and not everybody's gonna be pleased with it, right? But if it's, if it's in the contract, you kind of have to make do with what, you know, with what you have. The problem with that is you kind of derail other things on the, on the product roadmap. And you know, like we always joke um, at CareCloud, we don't really have a product roadmap because it changes, you know, it changes all the time. That's kind of what happens with the Agile methodology. But, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just had a follow-up question my question. Uh, do you ever have to bring in like, outside teams or separate it from the core product? Oh, yeah. If I want a, a purple button that you know, shoots rain out of it for some reason? Yeah, uh, exactly. If there's, like sure you said, if... It's usually the sales situation that drives that scenario. But yeah, we've, we've had that scenario happen several times. We're, we'll have to bring in um, an outside team or outsource a team or whatever we have to do because there's a time crunch and we have, we have a deliverable. So I think sometimes you have to make do with it. And I think it's okay, especially if it's a net new product that doesn't necessarily affect the core business. Um, but I think at that point you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons. Yeah. So if you were um, in a different position with smaller amount of engineers, you know, but still quite like a big market that you're uh, stepping into. You were like at CareCloud before you even had, you know, the amount of clients that you have now, you just have a couple big ones that you're trying to like service. Um, and then more than anything, you're also your development team is remote. So like, can you give me some advice on what it would be like to be in that position, to not really know where all of your assets are, or, like what really like your team is doing, and you're just kind of like trying to sure. hop on Hangouts and figure out what the issues are and what the clients are telling you like general feedback on like how to how you your team. Sure, so um, actually our engineers are on site, so they're not remote, which is actually really nice because from a product management perspective, I can just go up to their desk and bother them and then say, How's, how far along are you on that? You know, no, I don't do that. But um, <laughs> we do have some projects where we do have to uh, use remote teams, right, to work on certain things. If we're up against the deadline or whatever the case may be, um, it's definitely more difficult because there could be, you know, time differences, there could be um, miscommunication, there could be a lot of, you know, time wasted, kind of the turnaround time, right, from, from an ask to the, to the delivery. But I think that you just kind of learn, learn how to best work with those teams. So you, whether you change your schedule to kind of fit theirs, whether you change your requirements to make them more understandable to, you know, a, a different team, one may, maybe that's not the original, you know, care cloud team, so to speak. Um, it's kind of just getting to know your coworkers, really, is all it is. But I am very thankful that the majority of my engineers are on site. <laughs> What's the best product advice that you've received so from like another product manager when you started out in, like, in this product world? Um, what's the best advice you've gotten? I think um, that's a great question. I think my favorite thing that I've heard is it's okay to fail fast as long as you're ready to pick yourself up again, right? The, the, the thing about products and product management and, and releasing you know, as, as fast and quickly as some of these companies do um, is that you're, you're gonna fail, you're bound to fail, right? So the problem is figuring out whether you can pick yourself back up right after that and how quickly can you fail so you can you know, move on and build something better and greater. Thank you guys. Yep.